In this video, we're going to explore sorting collections in Python. But before we get into the Python code, let's first discuss sorting algorithms and the logic behind sorting a list. If you just want to see the code for how you sort a list or a dictionary in Python, jump to this timestamp shown here and we'll get into implementing it. Otherwise, we'll get into sorting algorithms and take a look at bubble sort. The goal of sorting algorithms is to place all elements of a collection in order. For example, if we have a list of numbers, the goal might be to sort the numbers from lowest value to largest value. While this seems like a simple task, how you accomplish this task has significant implications in terms of how your program is going to perform. This is in part why we have so many different sorting algorithms. Each one has its own trade-offs, properties, and efficiencies. The sorting algorithm we'll be taking a look at today is bubble sort. This sorting algorithm is notable mostly for its simplicity and being relatively easy to implement, which is why it's the first sorting algorithm most computer science students encounter and implement for themselves. Bubble sort works by repeatedly iterating through a list of values and swapping adjacent elements if they're in the wrong order. This is repeated until no more swaps are required and the list is in the correct order. Effectively, we're finding and placing the largest value at the end of the list each iteration through the list. So for the first iteration, we place the largest value at the end of the list. The second iteration, we place the second largest value at the second last location in the list. The third iteration, the third largest value, and the third last location in the list, and so on until the list is fully sorted. This process has a few advantages and disadvantages. For advantages, bubble sort is easy to understand and implement, which is why it's a popular first sorting algorithm for students to implement. And two, it does not require additional memory. As the swaps are done in place, we don't need to make a copy of the list or use much additional memory space. Bubble sort also has some disadvantages, namely that it's very slow for large data sets. There are much more efficient sorting algorithms, but they tend to be more complicated to implement. Here we have the pseudocode for the bubble sort algorithm. Pseudocode is a human readable and basic description of what we want a computer program or algorithm to do. It's not code that we can put into a computer and run. Rather, it's for explaining the logic of an algorithm to another human. So what we have here on the screen right now is not Python code. It's not something you could put into PyCharm or an editor and run, but a description that attempts to explain how bubble sort works. The basic idea is to loop through all the elements in the list and whenever we encounter an item that is larger than the next item in the list, we swap those items. We keep doing this loop through the list over and over, and swapping items that are directly beside each other in the list, if one's greater than the other, until we make it through the list without making any swaps. Once this happens, we know the list is sorted. So I know that's a lot to take in just from taking a look at that one slide. So let's go through an example of running this algorithm. And let's trace through and see how it works. So when tracing through this algorithm, there's two main variables in our algorithm that we want to keep track of. A is a list of sortable values. This is the input to our algorithm. The second variable, swapped, is a Boolean value that we're using to keep track of if we made it through the list without needing to swap any values. We need to know this as once we make it through the list without making any swaps, the list is sorted. So we know we're done. Let's start tracing through the algorithm at the very first loop. This while loop runs so long as swapped is set to true. This means this loop keeps running until we make it through the list without swapping any values. We start swapped is true, so that means we enter the loop. The first instruction in the loop is to set swap to false. This means if we do not find a pair of values to swap in this iteration of the list, and set swapped back to true, we'll exit the outer while loop. So hopefully this would also mean that the list is in sorted order. Next, we have a for loop that will iterate through all the values of A. One important note here is that depending on how you implement this, it may be one less than all the items in A. We will talk more about this when we show the Python implementation. Inside the loop that runs through the list, we just do one check to see if the current item in the list is larger than the next item in the list. 
For the first run through the list, the current item would be the first element of the list with a value here of 24. The next item in the list would be a second element with a value of 70. In this case, 24 is less than 70, so this if statement would evaluate to false, and we would not enter into the block of code that switches the values. Instead, we continue on with the next items in the list. In this case, the current item has a value of 70, and the next item has a value of 42. As 70 is greater than 42, this evaluates to true, and we enter the if statement block. The values of the current item and next item in the list are swapped. So that means the 70 and 42 here are going to change places. This pushes the largest value, in this case 70, towards the end of the list, and the smaller value towards the beginning of the list. So we're slowly getting into sorted order. Next, we updated our swapped variable. Setting this to true lets us know that a swap occurred in this iteration of the list, and we'll need to run at least one more time before we know this list is in a sorted order. We now move on to the next item in the list. And once again, we check that the value of the current item is larger than the next item. And again, the value of 70 in the current item is larger than the value in the next item. So that means we swap the values. We also set swap to true again, but this value was already set to true, so there's no real change here. And we keep repeating this process, moving on to the next item, comparing the current and next values, swapping them if the current value is greater, and so on and so on, until the largest value is slowly pushed to the end of the list. And we keep repeating this until we eventually reach the end of the list. At this point, we've made it through the list one time and pushed the largest value to the end of the list. In this case, the last value in the list is 96, and it is in the correct order. It's the largest value out of all the possible values here. However, we need to keep doing this process until all the values are in the correct order. So we know this will happen once we make it through the list at least one time without needing to swap any values. In this last run through the list, we did swap some values, which is why the variable swap is set to true, so we will need to run through the list again. And this is going to be the process each time. If we made any swaps, we have to run through the list again. If we didn't make any swaps, that means the list is sorted, and we can exit out of our algorithm. So we set swapped back to false and get started on redo running the loop through the list. Since we've been through this process one time before, this time we'll go through the steps a little bit faster. So we start by comparing the first and second items. In this case, 24 is not larger than 42, so we move on. So again, here, not larger. And this one is larger. So that means that we have to swap the values, and we also updated the swapped variable to true. This means that we'll have to run this loop at least one more time after this. So again, not larger. This one is larger, so we're going to do a swap. Again, 70 is larger, so we do the swap. And of course, the 96 is already in the correct location, so it's not going to be larger here, and we don't do a swap. OK, so we've made it through the loop. And we now know that the last and second last values are in the correct location. And now that we've made it to the end of the list once again, we restart the outer loop because swapped is true. And we reset swap to false. And then we're going to loop through the list again, making swaps when we find a smaller value to the right of the current value. This time we're going to let the algorithm play without too much commentary because we're already pretty familiar with the process. So let's play.
So note here that even though we know that these values at the end are in the correct order, the algorithm is still checking to see if they need to be swapped. And this is actually one of the ways we can optimize this algorithm that we'll talk about in a few seconds. Because since we know these values are in the right order, there shouldn't be any need to actually check if they need to be swapped. So we'll take a look at an optimized version of this pretty soon. Okay, we finally made it through the list. And at this point, we restarted the loop and swapped is set to false. This means we made it through the whole list without needing to do a swap. And that means the list is now in the correct order. So we can exit out of this while loop. Now I did mention that this algorithm could be improved or optimized. We waste a lot of time checking values that we already know are in the correct location at the end of the list. To improve this, we can simply reduce the number of elements the for loop runs through each iteration of the list. As we know, after each iteration of the list, another item is placed in the correct stop at the end of the list, so we shouldn't have to check those items again. Those would be the items I show in a blue highlight during the demo there. So a few changes are needed to implement this. First, we need to track how many times we run through the for loop. And we're going to do that with the variable n here. n starts as the length of the list, and we'll reduce its value by one each time we iterate through the while loop. This means each time we loop through one less value of the list, because we know that one more value is in the correct order. The first time the for loop runs, it will compare all the values, then all but the last item, then all but the last two items, then all but the last three items, and so on until everything is sorted. What this means is the optimized version of bubble sort will not check the values that are already guaranteed to be sorted. This does not impact the correctness of the algorithm. Both optimized and unoptimized versions will sort the list correctly. The optimized version just does it a bit faster. Let's now take a look at another way to visualize bubble sort, this time by also using sound. If you're interested in this or want to try it yourself, you can download the program at the link shown on the screen or just Google the sound of sorting. Okay, what we have here is a program called the sound of sorting. It's a cool little program that lets us visualize a few different sorting algorithms. So what we can see on the screen right now is a bunch of bar graphs. These bar graphs represent values in some sort of collection, list, array, something like that. The height of each bar represents the value of that item. So the goal of the sorting algorithm is to take these bars that are right now in a random order and put them in order from smallest to largest. That would be ascending order. This program lets us pick a few different sorting algorithms to visualize. In this case, we're going to visualize bubble sort. In this case, it is the optimized version of bubble sort that doesn't do unnecessary checks of the items at the end. So once an item gets to the end, we know that's the largest. So we'll give it a run. And you'll be able to hear a little bit of sound when it's running. So the sound is going to sound a little bit random at first, but it represents the value of the item it's looking at. So as the list gets more and more sorted, the sounds will start sounding less random. Let's give it a run. So right now we have it fairly slow, and what is happening is it's going through the list, just the first time, and sort of pushing that largest value to the end of the list. Then we're going through a second time, and pushing the second largest value to the second um, last position in the list. And it'll keep doing this over and over again. We can actually speed it up a little bit. There's 100 items in this loop. And you can see each time it moves the current largest item to the end of our list. And it doesn't check those values again because it knows once they're there, they're the largest value, they're in the correct order, we don't need to search again. So we'll let this work. Notice that each time it runs through the list, it's running through one less time, which was that optimization we talked about. And there we go, the list is sorted. So I highly recommend that you try out this program. Um, it'll let you try out other sorting algorithms as well. And it gives you a good idea of how these different sorting algorithms compare. But for now, let's move on with 
our lecture on sorting. Okay, and that's all well and good, but how do we actually implement this in Python? Well, let's take a look at a Python implementation for using bubble sort to sort a list. There should not be anything too surprising here. This is an implementation of the logic shown for the optimized bubble sort. One important thing to note here is this for loop line that I have highlighted. Remember that the range function will default to starting at zero and is exclusive, meaning this loop will run from the value zero to n minus two. In this case, we want n minus one and not just n, as we do not want to overshoot the end of the list. If we want all the way to the end, the last item, we would have nothing compared to. Remember, we're comparing the current item with the next item. For the last item on the list, there is no next item. Thus, n minus one rather than just n. The code here performs the swap. We copy the value of the current item into a temp variable to save its value, and then we swap the next item's value into the current item, and then the value in temp into the current item. Let's now look at a simple example of sorting a given list. Here we are giving our bsort function, which is our implementation of bubble sort, a list of out of order values, and then printing the list before and after the function is called. And here's the output. After the function is called, the list is placed in the correct order. Note that as the lists are mutable and passed by reference, changing the order of the items in the function also changes the order of the items outside of the function. So we don't actually have to return anything from this function. So that works fine for lists, but what about dictionaries? What if we want to use bubble sort on a dictionary, maybe to sort it by the values? Well, it's a bit more complicated, but still definitely doable. Here we have an implementation of bubble sort that creates a copy of a dictionary that is now sorted by the key's values. Let's take a closer look. Our sorting function takes a dictionary as an argument and returns a copy of that dictionary sorted by values in ascending order. The first thing we do is create two lists. The sorted keys list is a list of the keys in the dictionary. We can use this dictionary key method to make a copy of the list of keys. The sorted vals list is a list of values from the dictionary. In this case, we use the values method to make a copy of a list of the dictionary's values. It's important to note that both of these lists will be in the same order as they are in the dictionary. The remainder of the algorithm works the same as performing bubble sort on the list of values, except when we swap the values in the value list, we also have to swap the keys at the same location. This keeps the key list and the value list in the same order, and at the end of the bubble sort, both lists should be sorted by value. Here we compare the current and next items in the values list. If the current item is larger, we swap the values in the values list, just like we would in a normal bubble sort. The difference here is that we also swap the values in the keys list at the same location. This keeps the keys in the same order as the values are in the values list, even when we make a swap to the values list. We also make that swap to the keys list to ensure everything is in the same order. We also have to perform one extra step when we're working with a dictionary. We now have a sorted list of values and a sorted list of keys, but we need a dictionary. So the last step is to combine these lists into a new dictionary that's in the correct order. Here we create a new empty dictionary that we're going to return. Next, we loop through each value in the keys list. And then for each value in the keys list, we create a new entry in the dictionary and give the corresponding value from the values list. This effectively copies all the key value pairs from the lists into the new dictionary. Then finally, we return the new sorted dictionary. In this case, we create a new dictionary rather than modifying the existing one. So we're going to have to return that new dictionary. So here's an example of us actually using this function. 
So here we call our bsort dictionary function with a dictionary that contains some names as keys and some floating point numbers as values. Both the original dictionary and the new sorted dictionary are printed to the screen. We can see that the sorted dictionary is now ordered by value from smallest to largest, just as we expected. We just saw how to write our own bubble sort based sorting functions for both lists and dictionaries. However, as sorting is such a common problem, there are built in functions and methods to handle sorting for us. While it is important to know how computers sort values and how you can implement that algorithm, in general, it is best to use the built in functions rather than implementing them ourselves, as the built in functions are more thoroughly tested and optimized. For straightforward lists of values of the same type, we have a very simple solution to sorting that takes advantage of those built in sorting functions and methods. So here we are sorting a list, and we're doing that by using the list sort method. The sort method sorts the list's values in ascending order by default. So we have the official definition here. The sort method sorts the list ascending by default. And you can see in the syntax, it does take a parameter called reverse that will let us reverse that order of sorting, make it descending. So the code here, it gives a list of integers and we print the values before calling sort and after calling sort. We can see that the sort method mutates the list and changes the order of the values to be in ascending order. That means it actually changes the list instead of creating a new copy of the list. The sort method also allows us to sort the list in descending order by providing the reverse parameter. So here I've added the reverse equals true. And now the list is sorted from largest to smallest. We call this descending order. So what about dictionaries? Unfortunately, this is not as easy as calling the sort method as dictionaries do not have a sort method. There is another function called sorted that we can use on a dictionary, but we can't simply provide it a dictionary. We need to tell it what to sort by. If we wish to sort by key names, for example, to sort this dictionary on screen now by the names such as Alice and Bob, we can use the sorted function as shown here. And if we ran this, the output would look like this. This would be a dictionary such that the key names are in alphabetical order, starting with Alice. The key here is the sorted function. This function takes an iterable collection and attempts to return a sorted version of that collection. To use it with a dictionary, we need to give it a set of items in the dictionary as a list of tuples that represent a key value pair. Luckily, Python dictionaries have a method called items that creates just such a list for us. When we pass this list of key value pairs to sorted, it sorts them by keys and the dict function converts it back to a dictionary, just what we wanted. So to give you the definition of the sorted function, as shown on screen here, the sorted function returns a sorted list of specific iterable objects. So those would be collections like lists and so on. And we can also see the syntax here. We gave it the iterable, that'd be like our dictionary. Um, we'll take a look at what the key does. And just like with the sort method, we do have an option to reverse it. So if we want to sort the dictionary by values instead, we need to do a little bit more work. In this case, we use the same sorted function, but provide an extra argument to tell it to sort by the values rather than the keys. So if we ran this code, this would be the output. The dictionary would be sorted by values. The keys parameter is a bit complicated, but it essentially takes a function that returns the value to sort by. The Lambda keyword is a bit more advanced than what we will cover in this course, so we don't expect you to understand Lambda or use it, but we can show you what it's equivalent to doing. Remember I said that it's like defining a function in one line. So instead of using Lambda here, we could display it like this. So in this case, we got rid of the Lambda expression. In this case, we are giving it a function name that will return the value from a key value pair. In this case, the name of that function is by value. 
So by value simply returns the value part of a key value pair. Remember, we're giving sorted the result of calling items on our dictionary. This creates a list of key value pairs. For each item in that list is a tuple that has the key at index zero and the value at index one. So the by value function that we can see on the screen right now simply looks at that tuple that has a key at index zero, a value at index one, and returns the value. This tells the sorted function to sort on the value, the values that the function returns. So instead of sorting the dictionary by keys, this sorts the dictionary by values. Again, this is a bit out of the scope of the course. We don't expect you to know the lambda functions. So just know that this line sorts the dictionary by values. So we can also use these built-in functions to sort more complicated structures, such as lists of dictionaries, lists of lists, or even dictionaries of dictionaries. To do this, we need to define a function that returns a value to sort by, just like we just saw. Let's take a look at an example with a list of dictionaries. So here we have an example of a list of dictionaries where each dictionary represents a record for a student. The dictionary for each student contains their names, grades for two assignments, the exam, and their final grade. In this case, we want to sort from the largest final grade to the lowest final grade. This would be in descending order. As the outermost collection is a list, we can use the list method and provide it a reverse argument as true to have it sort in descending order. Otherwise, by default, it would sort in ascending order. We want to sort the list by a specific value in each dictionary, the final grade. To do this, we need to define a function that returns the value to sort by if passed an item in the list. By saying key equals by final grade, this means that the sort method will use our final grade function to determine the value to sort by. In this case, our by final grade function simply returns the values stored at the key final grade. This causes the sort method to sort the list by final grade value for each item in the list, the items being a dictionary for each individual student. After we run this program, their output would be a list of dictionaries sorted by the final grade, which is great because that's exactly what we want. And we can see here that the list is now sorted in descending order. That's all I have for you in this video. Try going out there and experimenting now with some of these sorting methods and coming up with your own collections to give it a try on. Try to get a handle on how both sort works for lists as well as how the sorted function works in general. Also, I highly recommend trying out implementing bubble sort for yourself. We saw to do it for a list as well as a dictionary based on value. Maybe try doing it for a dictionary based on key instead. Either way, it's a good idea to have a good understanding of how the sorting algorithm works. We have a lot of built-in options to do sorting for us, but it is still important to understand how computers sort lists and other collections. This gives us a good understanding of how our code works under the hood, and eventually how we can optimize it to be faster and better. So thank you for watching this video and have a great day.